time in my life, I start on time. Um, my name is Grace Moser, I'm history faculty here at St. Charles Community College and a long time Democracy Days participant. It's one of my favorite times of the year, so thank you for being here today. And if anybody's watching online, thank you for watching online. Um, I, uh, today we are going to be talking about the Equal Rights Amendment, um, which a lot of you may not even know exists. Um, so one of the things I like about Democracy Days is that it's interdisciplinary. So today I have two of my sociology colleagues up here with me. Um, I have Monica Swindle, who is a sociology professor and also an instructional designer, which I really appreciate that she does on campus because I use that for online teaching. And then Dana Pruitt, who's also a sociology professor here on campus. Uh, and we're gonna be presenting different perspectives on the equal rights. So since I am a history person, I'll start because I'm gonna provide some of the historical context for the Equal Rights Amendment. So I asked Dana and Monica to do this because uh, it's something that is trending and relevant right now. Um, we don't have equality of protection under the law as women in the United States, although a lot of people think we do. And I was listening to a podcast over quarantine that talked about the Equal Rights Amendment and it was called Ordinary Equality. And um, that came from a quote by Alice Paul, who's actually the author of the Equal Rights Amendment and someone who was influential in getting women the right to vote in 1920. So I'm gonna read this quote to you. I never doubted that equal rights was the right direction. Most reforms, most problems are complicated. But to me, there is nothing complicated about ordinary equality. And I think that's a really good way to think about it because there's been a lot of unnecessary complications in the road towards women being granted full uh, equality under the law in the United States Constitution. And we're gonna be talking about what some of those reasons are. Um, so again, I think most people don't know this is even an issue. Um, in a poll that was done um, by AP News, um, in 2020, uh, they polled Americans and found that 73% of Americans support an equal rights amendment, yet we do not have one. What's even more telling is that 72% thought that it already existed. So just out of curiosity, how many of you thought before coming in here today that women had equal protection under the law in the United States? We actually do not because it is not in the US Constitution. There are laws in place like Title IX, for example, which is important legislation that protects against gender discrimination. But if you do not have a constitutional amendment, those laws are subject to being overturned by other laws. A constitutional amendment is essential to making sure that that law can never be overturned. So one of the things I'm gonna talk about with you today is on why we need an equal rights amendment is for two reasons, two L words, litigation and legislation, All right? So in order to have laws that will protect us, we need an equal rights amendment protected in the constitution. It makes it easier for people to create the laws that would protect women in, uh, from gender discrimination in the workplace, from sexual assault, Currently, it is very difficult to get those laws passed before Congress because it is not already written into the Constitution. The other L is litigation. Whenever a woman attempts to go through the court system in order to obtain uh, action against gender discrimination, um, the laws pertaining to women's rights are at a lower scrutiny level than other laws in the United States, and that's just judicial review. So scrutiny is a fancy word for judicial review. Um, that there's different levels of how much courts have to pay attention to it and, and make sure that no rights are being violated. For example, race discrimination, because it is protected, race is a protected status within the Constitution according to the 14th and 15th Amendments. Um, or our 14th Amendment which says you cannot discriminate on the basis of race. Um, that is at the highest scrutiny level. So if there's a, a case that is surrounding like a hate crime based on race or a national origin, then the courts are gonna give the highest level of scrutiny to that particular case and make sure that no violations are being made. Women's discrimination currently 
is at an intermediate scrutiny level, which means it's, there's, there's different levels. Um, rational is the lowest, intermediate is sort of this in-between unknown, where courts are directed by the uh, Constitution not to pay as close attention, not to have a stringent judicial review. And because of that, there, it is very hard for a gender discrimination case to get any satisfaction in the courts today. So an equal rights amendment would help protect that. So I know it's not very fun to listen to history teachers talk about history, so I thought I would share a video. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start this video it's sort of on the history of the Equal Rights Amendment. Short video, it's about six minutes long, and then we'll talk. Under the law shall not be denied or abridged on account of sex. Women's rights are human rights. It's an historic moment for the women of America. It's been almost a hundred years since the introduction of the Equal Rights Amendment an amendment to the U.S. Constitution designed to give equal legal rights to all persons regardless of sex, but it still hasn't been ratified. Let's start from the beginning. The National Women's Party announced its plan to campaign for an amendment to the Constitution that would guarantee men and women equal rights under the law. And for the next 20 some years, it was introduced in every single congressional session, never reaching the floor of the Senate or the House for a vote until 1946. In 1970, the National Organization of Women picketed the United States Senate. They were successful. Six months later, on August 26, more than 20,000 women held a protest to demand full social, economic, and political equality. We now celebrate this day annually on Women's Equality Day. On March 22, 1972, Congress passed the ERA, and it was sent to the state legislature with a seven-year deadline to be ratified by three-quarters of the states. By the end of that year, 22 states had ratified the amendment. That's when the conservative movement challenging it emerged. One of the most vocal opponents was Phyllis Schlafly. The major objection to the Equal Rights Amendment is that it would take away from women rights and privileges which they now have. Rights to uh, stay home. They and still have that right. The Equal Rights but Amendment does not, not take Not according that. to law. You knew Phyllis Schlafly. She hired you. Tell me what she was like. What was it like to be around her? She knew that there was this army of women out there who wanted to be another voice, that the, the feminist movement wasn't the only voice for women, that there were a lot of women who had something different to say. We are against the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment um, because we believe that women already have all the rights that the Equal Rights Amendment purports to give them. But now we have equal pay laws, um, more women than men are in college. We don't have discrimination against women in college or in hiring. And all these things are covered either by the Constitution or by federal law and state law. Phyllis always said she supported equal pay, exactly. but women make 79 cents on the dollar compared to men. Talk a little bit about how you don't think Equal Rights Amendment will help that. It's simply symbolic at this point because the ratification has expired and uh, people act like this is the be-all, end-all, and it's not. Mm -hmm. It really isn't, and I think the proponents of it are not telling the truth to the American people about what it would mean. You might be wondering, why are states still voting on the issue now? We call a lawyer to find out. Hello! Hi! Hi, nice to talk to you. Linda Coberly chairs the legal task force for the National ERA Coalition. So let's say another state does ratify it, is it, does it go into effect? What happens then? Congress uh, extended the deadline 
1972 uh, by another three years to 1982. Um, so why is that important? Well, the, the language of the deadline appears not in the part that the states are actually voting on, but in the introductory language from Congress. There's never been a situation in our history where a joint resolution of Congress has stood in the way of the effectiveness of a duly authorized, duly ratified amendment that has been voted on and approved by three quarters of the states. That just never happened before. Article five says an amendment is, is effective as soon as three quarters of the states ratify. And for the Equal Rights Amendment, we're gonna hit that mark next year, I believe. We're working very hard on the efforts to ratify North Carolina. And uh, in Virginia. Last year, Virginia decided to try to become the 38th state. I'm here to talk to Virginia State Senator Barbara Favola, who led the fight to pass it in Virginia. Let's go. We're talking about a constitutional amendment for half of the United States population. Um, and we believe that as representatives of our constituents, we should be able to stand up and have a real honest conversation and take a vote. Virginia last year, <laughs> I'm very proud to say that we did have the ERA amendment introduced in both the House and the Senate. And in the Senate in Virginia, we have passed the ERA each year for the past five years. Some of the Republicans who voted for it, I think, felt comfortable voting for it, knowing that it was going to reach its demise in the House. So that's been part of the political backdrop for its passage in the Senate. It has always seen its defeat in the House. What does it say about the United States that 35 states initially ratified this, but it's taken decades to, to finish it? People don't accept change very well. They are afraid of change for the most part. And, and I think with the ERA, it got caught up with a very uh, evolving, divisive political divide in our country. The fight for women's equality has been pretty long and complicated. Since the push for the ERA in the 1970s, four states have voted to rescind the amendment. Seven states still haven't ratified it at all. And if a state does become the 38th state to ratify it, that might just set off a whole new wave of political and legal battles. Things might just get a lot messier. One thing people quite frequently ask is, what laws is it going to change? What, what do we need it for right this minute? And the answer is, it's not going to change many laws right now, but that's fine. It's like the free speech amendment when the, the framers put in the Bill of Rights. They didn't think, what laws is it going to change right now? They thought this is a good principle to have in a constitution. Equal rights for women is a principle that should be in the constitution. Won't change many laws right now, but down the pike when the Supreme Court meets this or that or the other problem, there will be a principle in the constitution that says women have equal rights to men. It really began starting before 1848, but then in the 1848 convention, then finally, 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 women got the vote in 1920, then 1923. The same women who got the vote for women put the Equal Rights Amendment before the Congress. And it was voted down. They put it in the Congress the next year, it was voted down. Put it in the Congress the next year, it was voted down. Until the modern women's rights movement, it just languished there. But in that great surge in the 60s, some women took it forward and it passed lots and lots of states. It ended up three states short. And only um, in the late 90s did some law school students uh, who had been inspired by some work that a young man at the University of Texas had done, they picked it up and they realized, actually this deadline is a deadline that was set by Congress. If that Congress sets the deadline by majority rule, it can take away the deadline by majority rule. And in fact, we've gone forward and we have just one state left to ratify the ERA. This is really a bipartisan issue. 
You know how polarized the United States is right now. We're likely to be pushed in various directions, but the Republican Party was the party that was the very much the supporter of the Equal Rights Amendment at the beginning, and the Democratic Party going along dragging its heels for complicated reasons. But e even now, even in this polarized era, you find in many, many states bipartisan support, or otherwise it couldn't have been able to get through those states. Okay, so those videos were a little bit older and they were kept talking about the last state to ratify. But last year, um, Virginia became the 38th state to ratify. So that woman, the activist was talking about how it was um, put before the Senate on the understanding that it would fail in the House, but they actually got it to pass the House last year. And now we have the three fourths required to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. But President Trump, when he was in office, directed um, and under the Department of Justice, the um, National Archives, which normally just like s implements the amendments and says this is what they are, they directed them not to do anything with the Equal Rights Amendment. So it is currently just sitting there, uh, an amendment that has passed three-fourths of Congress and three-fourths of the states sitting there languishing, waiting to see what the solution will be. So um, it is really symbolic at this point, um, but it is something that can be changed. So I wanted to give you guys, um, and I'm gonna not talk much longer because I want um, these other two ladies to have a chance to talk, but I wanted to give you sort of like an understanding of where women's rights are globally because very often people think about the United States as being the best. Like very often when I hear, when I complain about not having equal rights, people are like, well, look at Saudi Arabia. Like the United States is so much better than Saudi Arabia. And I'm like, well, look at France. <laughs> France has explicit protections for women. There are 10 countries in the world that have protections written into their constitution for women that have equality on the books. And that has led to amazing legislation. Like, um, for example, and I think maybe Denmark? Um, one of the Norwegian countries, um, they have laws in the books that say that you have to have equal number of men and women as legislators. Uh, I didn't look up, I don't know if you guys looked it up, how many, what the percentage, the ratio of, uh, in government, men to women. I know it's... We've got some work to do. Yeah, we got some, I think it was like 20 something maybe. Like 20% women to 80% men. I could be wrong. I might just be making that up. And that's not a good strategy to do if you're a teacher, but hey. Um, so if we had like a true 50-50, like that is maybe equality. Um, so 10 countries um, have it, we still do not. It is definitely room for improvement. Um, I wanted to share this with you. This is from the worldpolicyforum.org. And it's a map of the world and the countries that have um, an approach to gender equality. And um, you can see all the blue. They have blue guarantees gender equality. And the United States has general equality guaranteed, but gender is not mentioned. So we do not have true gender equality. We have equal protections, like we value equality, but we're still not explicitly protecting 50% of the population. So that is room for the United States to grow. Um, so without an amendment, legislation um, is affected. The laws that we have on the books that protect against gender discrimination do not have the same power. I was reading to, or listening to a, a great podcast that I have linked I could show you guys at the end. It was episode four of Ordinary Equality. They were talking about female genital mutilation laws. Are you guys familiar with FGM? It's a practice that is um, child sexual abuse of cutting girls' genitals, um, removing the sexual parts from different various um, parts from um, girls, usually from the age of seven. Um, it is currently not legal, but it is allowed. It's not prosecuted in the United States, and it happens to 
um, nearly half a million girls in the United States. Usually we associate that practice with other countries, but it's happening currently in the United States to American citizens by American citizen doctors. Um, and the federal government in 2017 passed a law making a federal ban on FGM, and the courts overturned it, not because they disagreed with whether FGM should be allowed, but because they said that since it is not in the Constitution um, to protect against gender discrimination, that it's up to the states to be decided. And so the states can issue a ban on it, but not the federal government, which is just incredibly crazy to me. Um, and that was as early, recent as 2017. You know, child abuse. Child abuse is protected, but because of the course interpretation, um, in this one case, FGM is not. So the bottom line for me is that um, an amendment is needed just to give women equal protection that is guaranteed, right? Not that is subject to different um, uh, political parties being in office, not that it's subject to political whims, people change their mind, as you can see with the three states that rescinded their right to, or their ratification. So having something in place, which by the way, let me just say, I don't think you should be allowed to rescind ratification. <laughs> like if you get it ratified, like, I mean, are we just gonna like all of a sudden decide to rescind ratification of the 13th Amendment and just let that go back? Like having slavery still be in place? That doesn't make any sense to me. I don't think that that's a good policy. But anyways, that's what some states have done. Um, we need that, that ultimate protection. 75% um, of the country already supports it today. That's way more than 51%. That is a major majority. Um, and you know, we claim to be a country that is democratic and about equality. We can live up to ideals for the other 50% of our population. Um, so thanks for listening to me. I am going to throw up these resources again at the end of my session, but I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Monica and she's gonna pull up hers. And then we'll, we'll leave time for questions too. Okay, so a question about the ERA that I found particularly interesting and productive is why was there opposition to the ERA, and more specifically, why were there women opposed to a constitutional amendment designed to ensure their rights at this most fundamental level? So I wanna spend a little time exploring the opposition and the backlash to the ERA. Um, and opposition seems to fall along three main lines. Opposition from the labor movement, ideological opposition from conservative women's groups, and opposition from those who believe that the ERA is no longer necessary. Okay. So while early on there was a lot of support for the ERA among middle class women, some of the earlier opposition to the ERA came from working class women and labor groups, concerned that the ERA would undo hard-won protections for women workers. So many women were working in abysmal conditions in factory jobs, and labor reformers were concerned that the language of the ERA, while it was designed to prohibit discriminatory laws based on sex, that it might also prohibit protective laws specific to women workers. So for instance, um, factory safety standards, minimum wage, maternity provisions, shorter work hours, and no night work or heavy lifting. So this is a letter, um, it was written in 1945, from Margaret Austin Stone of the National Committee to defeat the Unequal Rights Amendment and to promote equal opportunities. And that was a coalition of 20 organizations, which included labor unions that gained momentum during the Great Depression and the war and lobbied together against the amendment. And this was a letter to Representative Hatton Sumners of the U.S. House of Representatives. And so this coalition argued that many women relied on the protection of the government. Hazardous work conditions and long hours of labor were kept in check through laws that they argued could not exist under the ERA. We also see here advocacy instead for a narrower, more focused state laws to redress discrimination as opposed to the more fundamental approach of the ERA. 
and the unfortunate consequence, which Grace already mentioned here, of addressing inequality at the state level is inconsistency between the states and a greater ease for these protections to be rolled back according to the prerogative of the current legislature. So interestingly, Eleanor Roosevelt, who's usually lauded for her work, was in this camp and was opposed to the ERA. In the 1930s, New Deal legislation extended some protections to all workers regardless of gender, in large part thanks to the efforts of Eleanor Roosevelt, who, though she was opposed to the ERA, helped draft early versions of New Deal proposals, ensuring an eight-hour workday and collective bargaining for both men and women. She supported equal pay for women, but opposed the ERA because she believed it would undo and prohibit gender-based protective legislation that she and other reformers had sought for women in the workplace. So things like factory safety standards, minimum wage laws, the 48-hour work week, and yes, you heard that right, 48 hours, elimination of night work, and exclusion from dangerous jobs. And we can also see um, in this opposition and exemplified in this quote, a tension that's carried through the feminist movement, that of an approach that sees men and women as fundamentally similar and in need only of a level playing field, and those that see women's needs, or at least some of them, as different from men's and therefore in need of special protection. That brings us to our second main strand of opposition to the ERA, and that was ideological opposition. So while that earlier opposition to the ERA came from and on behalf of working class women, the late 1970s and early 80s saw a backlash against the progress that feminism had made generally and to the ERA specifically, and mostly among middle class conservative women, largely on ideological grounds. Probably the most outspoken and well-known of these was Phyllis Schlafly. She was born in St. Louis in 1924. She attended private school, which her family was able to afford because her mother worked seven days a week. She went to Wash U, earned her undergraduate de degree while working nights test firing guns at a munitions factory, went on to study at Radcliffe, earning a master's degree in government. She worked for a conservative think tank, married and became a mother, ran for Congress in 1952, wrote books, pursued a law degree, was leader of political organizations Stop ERA and the Conservative Eagle Forum. So she clearly benefited from the work that feminists before her had done, while at the same time advocating against them, um, rejecting, even demonizing feminism, while referring to herself first and foremost as a housewife. And I think it's really important to, to consider what Schlafly did, um, because what she did was she really reframed the debate about the ERA into a defense of traditional gender roles in society. According to feminists, the ERA was necessary because it would change a status quo defined by the inferior position of women in society. Whereas according to anti-feminist women like Schlafly, the ERA would alter a status quo defined by the superior position of women. Schlafly writes, the truth is that American women never had it so good. Why would we lower ourselves to equal rights when we already have the status of special privilege? So she argues that the passage of the ERA and the equality it offered would actually be a step down for women, that they already were in a superior position in society. And you have some quotes here too from her contemporaries. Oh, that's really hard to see. So she argued that it would strip them, strip women of their privileges, such as alimony, child support, protection from the draft, that it would break, tear apart traditional family units, that it would compel publicly funded universal child care, that it would protect abortion rights and therefore increase abortion rates, that it would give gay men and women, and this is her quote, the same dignity as husbands and wives, that was something she saw as a bad thing, and that it would disintegrate a woman's most important roles, those of a wife and mother. Supporters of Schlafly took homemade bread, jams, and apple pies to the Illinois state legislators with slogans like, preserve us from a congressional jam, vote against the ERA sham, 
and I am for mom and apple pie. So she reframed this debate into one about femininity and gender roles um, in society. And her approach was ultimately really successful. In 1977, the ERA had won 35 state ratifications, three short of its goal. Schlafly and her grassroots movement ensured those three additional ratifications didn't happen. And in fact, their efforts pushed several states to retract their ratifications, as we heard. So that brings us up to today. The three main arguments made in opposition today are that the ERA is no longer needed, that it might inadvertently stand in the way of legislating inequality, and that the clock has run out on the amendments. So there's a strain of thinking now that holds that feminism is no longer needed, that its goals have been met, we've got gender equality in our society. You heard that um, in some of the quotes from the first video that we watched. In 1971, in Reed versus Reed, the Supreme Court found for the first time that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment did indeed prohibit sex discrimination. So opponents hold that the ERA is no longer necessary thanks to that extension of the 14th Amendment to cover multiple forms of discrimination, including on the basis of sex. Though I do think it should be noted that in 2011, in an interview with a law magazine, former Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia argued that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment does not, in fact, protect against discrimination on the basis of gender or for what is worth sexual orientation either. So not having this enshrined in the Constitution leaves equality up to interpretation. Additionally, opponents argue that the ERIA would apply only to government, not to the private sector, where much of the lingering inequality still exists. A second line of opposition today that the ERA um, is that the ERA could actually impede the government from addressing inequality by imposing a sort of legislative blindness to sex and gender, similar to what has been seen more recently with the court's application of the Equal Protection Clause to racial equity issues. Kim Ford Masry, who's a professor of law at the University of Virginia, expresses concern that the ERA would require the government to ignore sex as an unintended consequence, ignore sex-based inequality as well. He writes, the ERA would likely prohibit government from acting on account of sex and therefore from acting on account of or in response to sex inequality. Put simply, government would have to ignore sex, including sex inequality. Lastly, there are procedural concerns um, that, as Grace talked about, about the ratification process, retra retractions, and the timeline for passage. That deadline passed in 1982, um, even though in February of 2020, the House passed a joint resolution to remove the deadline to ratify. Opponents say Congress cannot retroactively change its imposed deadline after it expired. Three states have retracted the ratification, though there's disagreement. Um, not only over whether they should, but other, over whether they legally can even do that. Um, the amendments also mired in lawsuits. The attorneys general of Alabama, Louisiana, and South Dakota filed suit opposing ratification, but the attorneys general of Virginia, Nevada, and Illinois filed suit to force the amendment to be added to the Constitution. So political and legal challenges to the ratification process are going to have to be resolved. Uh, before the Equal Rights Amendment can be published with certification of its ratification as part of the Constitution. Lastly, um, I think it's always important to say, what can we do? If you are interested in this issue and would like to do more, I would say the first thing is to learn more. These are two really great organizations, the Alice Paul Institute and the ERA Coalition. They have got a ton of great information on their websites. You can just Google them. They've got media kits, um, resources. Uh, the ERA Coalition also has an advocacy map. You can just put your zip code in and it will pull up and tell you who your representatives are and you click a button, it's very easy to contact them. So um, reach out, speak to your representatives, let them know how you feel about this issue. Lastly, if you're interested in issues like this, um, we do have a, Sociology is offering a course in the second eight week part of term for fall online um, called Sex, Gender, and Society. So. You can join me to learn more <laughs> about these issues in that course. And that's, that's it for me. Yeah. All right, so I am going to be um, speaking more to some of the contemporary uh, issues, especially in the domains of work and education. 
uh, that suggests that we still have some ways to go when it comes to uh, gender equality. Something that I want to echo uh, from both Grace and Monica is the importance of legal precedent. When we think about law, there are some important similarities to how we do science, for example. Right, what we do in the present build on what happened in the past. And so just like we build on knowledge by knowing what we've done before, law operates in a similar fashion, where former legal precedent makes an important contribution to what happens moving forward. So that when there are um, rulings that may repeal or uh, how rulings may interpret the law, uh, that's an incredibly important uh, stepping stone for what happens next when it comes to legal protections. So the attention uh, that has been given among us on the panel about legal precedents, how laws are interpreted, defined, and understood is incredibly important for that reason, right? Because the past um, helps inform the present and therefore the future. And when it comes to the symbolism of laws and policies, and this is where I'll put on my, my big time sociologist hat, <laughs> How we understand the social world is structured by a number of things, right? We are given a lot of information about what's considered to be important in our society. Laws and policies help communicate what's important. They enforce uh, and provide social order, but they also tell us what's important enough to protect. So in terms of thinking about the symbolism of it, while you know symbolism may be uh, used in sort of a derisive way sometimes, like, oh, it's just symbolic, actually symbolism can be incredibly important to us as well because it communicates in more general terms what it means to be a protected citizen right? and how we come to understand that. Um, so that being said, uh, to think about the more contemporary landscape, one of the criticisms that uh, sometimes arises when it comes to the ERA is that we have policies that protect on the basis of gender, and we do. Um, there's the Title, uh, title VII of the Civil Rights Act, uh, which protects with regards to employment discrimination on the basis um, of gender. There's the Equal Pay Act of 1963, and then later on, the Lilly Ledbetter Act. And then we have uh, Title IX, which protects, uh, which provides protections uh, in the domain of education from institutions that are receiving federal funding, right? But something to note about those different laws and policies is that they, they tend to protect more specific domains, right? And so when we think about uh, gender protections in general, right, without an amendment, there is not a general protection uh, that exists. Uh, to ensure that gender is considered a protected status, right? We have different laws that protect important domains, but what we end up with is somewhat of a patchwork. And with the 14th Amendment, yes, it has absolutely been cited in cases uh, that reflect issues of gender uh, and sexuality as well. But uh, as Monica pointed out, as late as 2011, right, we have interpretations that um, it doesn't actually protect gender, right? So when we think about the differences in interpretation and the patchwork of laws, having a, an amendment can provide an important and clear boundary about what it means to protect gender as a status and to really help us define gender discrimination. Now to think about some present and more contemporary issues, while we live in a society where most of us probably expected that there was already there were already protections and where some protections do exist, there are also some considerable issues, especially in domains of like work and schooling. That's not to dismiss uh, areas like healthcare or family, where there are also certainly uh, important and glaring issues in gender inequality. But as a sociologist, uh, I am, um, I tend to focus mostly on area, uh, education and work in terms of my research. So that is where I tend to be pulled when I think about uh, the importance of having an Equal Rights Amendment. So when we think about uh, what discrimination looks like, it can be often very hard to tap into discrimination because there are so many different avenues of social life where it can uh, come into play and the way that people are treated in the workplace. Um, but even though it may be hard to detect, there are, of course, some important outcomes when it comes to discrimination. And if you're curious uh, the extent to which discrimination exists, it can be hard to say because these things tend to be underreported. Uh, but if we can rely on some figures, uh, for example, the 
Equal Opportunity uh, Commission reported that in 2020 there were 700 discrimination claims on the basis of gender that were considered reasonable. There were many, many more uh, claims that were made, but at least 700 of them were considered to be reasonable claims. So there are markers that uh, discrimination is continuing on the basis of gender. Now to think about what that may look like, an area that often comes up is with regards to pay. And we talk a lot about equal pay. The Equal Pay Act of 1963 uh, sought to provide protections in terms of men and women uh, having uh, comparable work and being paid uh, the same. Uh, although over time, though some of those protections were eroded, that necessitated the Lilly Ledbetter uh, Fair Pay Act later on in 2009, uh, which heightened the burden of proof for, dis uh, for workplaces to prove that they were not engaging in discriminatory practices. Right? And such a, a measure was important because a pay gap still exists. Now, there are a number of factors that go into the pay gap, but even when we control for those factors like time spent at work, the different types of jobs that men and women tend to be sorted into, there is still a pay gap that persists. And when we think about a pay gap that takes place over the course of one's lifetime, that can be a difference of thousands of dollars in terms of the earned wages uh, between men and women. And when we think about other forms of uh, more general discrimination, um, the EEOC reports that about 700 uh, cases were considered to be um, credible, reasonable cause claims. Um, but more general survey research suggests that this is a rather widespread concern. So Pew Research, uh, which conducts nationally representative surveys found that 42% of women uh, suggested experiencing gender discrimination at work compared to about of men. Some of that may include pay, but it also includes uh, issues of promotions, hiring, firing, and other issues that can occur across the employment pipeline. But 42% of women is no small number. So even if we don't fully know the extent to which discrimination exists, Right, the experience of it uh, is not something that's uncommon. Um, another form of uh, discrimination that tends to uh, get some attention is what we often call a motherhood penalty. And this reflects uh, a difference in the amount that mothers may be paid uh, in terms of salary and benefits in comparison uh, to fathers. So the motherhood penalty estimates uh, that about $16,000 a year are lost in wages uh, because women may be considered to uh, not be as devoted to the work or may not be, uh, may be assumed to not uh, be there as often, right? But over the course of a lifetime, this number can add up to a considerable degree. So again, even though when we think about discrimination, it can be very hard to pinpoint what that looks like. There are very real and tangible outcomes uh, that result from discrimination, right? And there is evidence that there is ongoing discrimination in the areas of work uh, when it comes to gender. And one of the ways that we can see that is how it impacts income and wages. Another way that we can think about uh, discrimination that might exist in the workplace is harassment. Um, and about 72% of men and 82% of women suggested that when it comes to uh, equal rights among men and women, addressing sexual harassment is considered important, right? But when we think about uh, more generally the existence of the statistics suggests that uh, harassment uh, in the workplace is unfortunately rather common, even though it is something that we see as being rather important to pursuing equal rights. Now, interestingly enough, um, a 2019 study uh, found that there was a decrease uh, in sexual attention and coercion among women in their workplace over the past couple of years. And one of the reasons that the researchers cited was that there was increased attention uh, from the Me Too movement when it comes to issues of gender inequality and harassment in the workplace. And what this suggests to us is that even though, you know, uh, harassment 
continue, persists in our society, calling attention to it can be uh, rather important. And so to think about some, uh, back to that symbolic importance of having legislative measures that communicate what is allowed and isn't allowed, what is important and is important, um, this can have some tangible potential benefits, right, if we uh, have measures in place that are protective. So outside of work, um, I mentioned Title IX uh, with education. And despite the fact that there have been advances when it comes to education, um, when it comes to uh, gender and harassment, uh, gender harassment on college campuses and issues of sexual assault, um, this is something that is unfortunately rather prevalent uh, when it comes to college campuses. Um, according to the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, about 20% uh, percent of women have experienced, attempted or completed rape. About 81% percent of women have experienced sexual harassment and assault. Now, that same organization also mentions that 25% percent of men experience some form of sexual violence in their lifetime, and about 43% percent of men report uh, having experienced some sort of sexual harassment uh, or assault in their uh, in their experience. All right, but. What this suggests to us is that um, gendered violence, right, on, in various capacities is still a problem when it comes to uh, college, um, college campuses and uh, air, uh, organizations of higher education. Now, while we do have measures in place like Title IX that are intended to be protective, there are also issues with, for instance, statute of limitations uh, in ways that Title IX can be applied. There was a case in Texas uh, in 2017, I think this uh, was when the, um, the, the case uh, really got some attention. But a student uh, was sexually assaulted. Her university um, didn't necessarily investigate, and this is, a this is a situation where the student should have been protected in under Title IX. However, the interpretation when it came to Title IX was that Title IX was not actually considered relevant until the student was made aware that her institution had bobbled the investigation of her sexual assault. So until she had some sort of formal uh, or known or reasonable recognition that her institution had bobbled this investigation, she technically wasn't really entitled to those protections. That suggests some serious concerns in terms of how policies and laws may be implemented. And when we think about uh, states having like a patchwork of things like statute of limitations, or we have a patchwork when it comes to interpretations uh, of laws and policies, that can create not only a climate that can be dangerous for people, but it can also, um, it can also make it difficult for the existing policies to do what they need to do. All right, so when we think about uh, the potential importance of having constitutional protections, right, that say this is a protected status and under the law of the land this is a protected status, symbolically that could provide, um, symbolically that can provide a uh, signal as far as the, the urgency uh, in addressing gender inequality, but it can also help with legal precedent. Right, because if it is considered the law of the land, then uh, some of the uh, patchwork right, that we see when it comes to how policies are interpreted and implemented right, can possibly start to be addressed a bit differently. So we still have some ways to go uh, when we think about some of these domains that are very key uh, to our everyday experience. Right, if we think about how much time we spend with, in areas like education or work, or even with things like healthcare and family, these are very, very important domains and areas where we can uh, more fully address gender inequality. And when it comes to issues of things like sexual assault, right, having more uh, straightforward and direct guidelines can also help us um, address issues across the gender spectrum as well. Great. Well, that's, that's what we have to say. Do you guys have any questions? Yes. I'd be happy to take this microphone anywhere in the room. I see a hand. Just give me a moment.
Thank you for a wonderfully detailed presentation. Looking forward to the questions and comments. Yes, let's give them a hand clap. Hi, I'm Melina. Um, so my question is for all three of you. Um, you can each choose to answer if you'd like. Um, so uh, what is your personal or impersonal definition of being a protected citizen? That's a good question. Um, for me, that would be um, having something written down that the government views me as being someone that has rights. So since gender is not explicitly mentioned in the Constitution, I think that that's open for interpretation. So having some specific measure that I can go back to and say, look here, it's guaranteed right here, written in the Constitution, that I as a woman cannot be discriminated against, that I have value, that the court has to take my concerns legitimately, that if I've been mistreated in some way, that my rights as a citizen will be protected, like that to me is a protected citizen. I don't know if that, does that answer your question? What about you guys? I think it means for me that my social characteristics do not necessarily define my citizenship, that I am entitled to protections just by virtue, right, of being a person that exists in the world, right, and that, that that's those protections, that those rights are not necessarily parsed out on the basis of my social identities or categories. And for me, I'd say, um, I think the legal definition of that is much more important than the, the personal definition, um, because it's gonna, I mean, it's gonna affect how, how, how laws are written, how courts interpret. Um, but, but that aside, for, uh, for, for me, for a personal definition, I think, I think it's just making sure that the group that I'm a part of is included in all of the rights granted by our Constitution. And that's why I think it's important. Who's next? Who's got a question or a comment? Do I see a hand? If you guys aren't going to talk, I can talk more. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that I originally was like thinking about this doing this panel, and I asked Dana and Monica to help me with it. Um, I remember being heartbroken the first time I realized that I didn't have full equality. Like, heartbroken. And I was, like, raised in a generation, like, we were told that our mothers and our grandmothers had done everything for equality, and now we were fully equal. I could be whatever I wanted to be. I could, like, I remember specifically my mom, like, sitting me down and being like, Grace, you can do whatever you want to do. You're smart you could become a doctor. And I was like, I don't like blood. And she's like, it's okay. You don't have to be a doctor. I'm just saying you're smart. And nothing's going to hold you back. And I also remember the first time I was ever sexually harassed. And I remember that feeling of just grossness. A grown man, I was 15 years old, and a grown man grabbed my butt in front of my parents, but in a way where they didn't see it, and I just felt completely unprotected and vulnerable at 15 years old. And I remember getting a job and thinking, now I got it, everything's gonna be okay, I'm protected. And then finding out that I didn't have paid maternity leave. And that I would, if I, if I took the time to have my kids, I would not be paid over that time. I got really sick. I've been pregnant twice, but I have three kids. I had twins. I got really sick um, with my daughter and was not able to work. Um, I lost the ability to walk and talk for a while um, because my uh, immune system was attacking my brain and my spine because I had a post-infectious uh, response to a virus. And I had some protection, but I remember like not wanting to use my sick pay to recover while I was still pregnant because I was afraid I would not have it for maternity leave after. 
So I decided to work still and teach online and type with one finger, giving feedback to students because I could not type with all of my hands. That was not a protected citizen. So I think that we walk around thinking that things are normal, but it's, it's heartbreaking, guys. Like, it's heartbreaking to realize that you are not really viewed the same, that these things are still allowed to happen. And they're gonna keep happening until there is some power behind a law. Like, we have laws in place, right? But them actually being enforced and us being allowed to challenge them when they're not enforced, that is where the gap is. And also knowing that your rights are subject to whichever party happens to be in, in Congress or whatever generation of people there. Like true equality is, is true visibility. True equality is having, is seeing yourself represented in the government. That's powerful. And I think it's something that a lot of, a lot of people, well, I, I hate to use this term, but it's a privilege. It's a privilege to look at your Congress and see yourself represented. And that's not the case for lots of people in the United States. So, I don't know, those are just my thoughts. Like, didn't say that in my original presentation, but I think getting personal like helps make it connect more. Just out of curiosity, have you guys ever felt like that? Like, have you ever felt like unseen, unequal? Did you have that reckoning? I think that's a lot of a lot of us have that experience. Does anybody have any questions, comments? Yeah, this is your time. If you've got a question or a comment, let's hear from you. Does anybody think that they might take this issue further? So you'll be curious to know what you can do going forward. There's these websites up here. And also, if you go to equalrightsamendment.org, um, that has um, toolkits and things. It has the different approaches that you can take. Um, so there's been some actions uh, in place, like what Monica was saying, the House has voted on whether or not to um, change the, the law the time frame, but the Senate has not yet. Um, you can contact your senators. Missouri has some um, bullheaded senators. I don't know if they would like really listen to you, but I mean like Mr. Josh Hawley and Roy Blunt, um, contact your senators and tell them that you support uh, a change on the Equal Rights Amendment law, putting the deadline in place. Um, you'll probably get an email saying, uh, I appreciate your, your message, but I'm going to do my own thing, which is what I usually get when I email Josh Hawley. Um, but every little like phone call, every little letter that they get, like they have to document that, and they're going to take note of that. And I forgot what the, like, the ratio they say, like for every person, one person that counted as like a certain percentage of their constituents that are reaching out, because most people don't reach out. Another thing I think you can do is what Monica was saying, which is just educate yourself, figure out what's going on. There are two different approaches that people are taking. I know Ruth Bader Ginsburg argued that we shouldn't take the approach of overturning um, the, the state uh, ratification time period, that we should just start over with a new amendment. Um, if 72% of the population supports it, Maybe that would eliminate the possibility that it wouldn't make it, like just go ahead and propose a new Equal Rights Amendment. Um, it is frustrating right now because it's just sitting there. I mean, it has 38 states. It was arbitrarily added. There is a really interesting study that's done on the 27th Amendment that was ratified like 200 years after it was written. Um, so it doesn't have to be this arbitrary time limit. That was something that was put in place. And I forgot to mention this in my presentation, but Alice Paul was still alive when um, Congress passed the Equal Rights Amendment. And everybody was celebrating, but Alice Paul wasn't around. And somebody went and tracked her down, and she was sitting in a room, and she was crying. And they're like, well, 
are you crying because you're happy? And she said, no, they just killed the Equal Rights Amendment. And they said, what? We passed it. She said, but they put a time limit. That time limit, like she knew that that time limit was what was going to stall out the Equal Rights Amendment ratification and ultimately kill it. So um, I don't know. I think we have to ask the question of who does it benefit to not give women this right? Because I, I spent a lot of my life being mad at Phyllis Schlafly to the point that when she died, my students like sent me congratulatory posts on Facebook, <laughs> which sounds really bad. But I really, really hated Phyllis Schlafly for a long time. Um, and now I'm realizing that you know she had all these things. Like there was people in power behind her. Who was funding her? Who was giving her the platform to actively work against women's equality? And, you know, I think it's, it's just an, an interesting thing. I think if we really think about the py- power dynamics is who would stand to lose by women having equality. I don't know. I think Congress would lose something. Congress are, I mean, there's so many cases of, like, every scandal that's with the politician is, seems like lately it's sexual harassment and, of women. Like, of all the politicians who have gotten in trouble for that. Think of all the Hollywood executives that have gotten in trouble for that. Oh, no, I'm just talking. Do you guys have anything else? It, it's deeply personal to me. Do you guys have anything to say? No? Nobody else has anything to say? Okay, well. Practice some democracy and get involved on this if you're interested in it, if it's something that you want to do. I don't know, Michael? What do you say? Thank you once again for a highly informative panel. Thank you for being here. We have one more session today at 1 o'clock, an analysis of the 2020 election. And then uh, check out the program on your way out. I didn't distribute programs prior to this session, but we've got Wednesday and Thursday with a lot of great content. Thank you. I guess it's a good thing that people didn't have, maybe people aren't questioning you for it.